to tell you a little bit about my history and my studio as it is today. And I want to tell you about a little project I've been working on for the last 30 odd years. Um, in 1971, I took my life savings of $306 out of the bank to build this tiny studio in the northern part of Vermont. I also had some Dacron sail canvas, and I used it to sew together a home to live in, and I began to teach myself how to blow glass. At the time, I thought the most challenging and difficult thing that I could ever learn to make would be perfectly matched sets of wine goblets. And so that's what I did for 16 years. Um, eventually got it right. But, but I don't really know sometimes what has held my attention about glassmaking for all these years. Whether it's the color, or the heat, or the fire, the flame. Glass is an alchemic blend of sand and metallic oxides combined with extraordinary blinding heat. The result is a material that flows and drips like honey. When it's hot, Glass is alive. It moves gracefully and inexorably in response to gravity and centripetal force. It possesses an inner light and transcendent radiant heat that make it simultaneously one of the most fascinating and one of the most insanely frustrating materials for an artist to work with. I took it as a good omen when I moved here to Western Massachusetts when I found several handmade marbles in the flower bed outside my kitchen window. And when I brought them in and cleaned them off, they were just as bright and beautiful as they were on the sunny afternoon that kids got called in to lunch maybe 50 years before. It made me think about the longevity of glass and how ancient glass, truly ancient glass, wasn't preserved lovingly by collectors. It was dug up by archaeologists. The other thing that happened when I moved here was that one of the teachers asked me if I would be willing to demonstrate all the to glass blowing to all the eighth graders in the county. And I said, sure, not realizing, well, how many kids there were, and, and also not realizing how difficult it is to entertain eighth graders. I don't know if you've ever known an eighth grader, but these are people that will suffer no boredom whatsoever in their lives. And so <clears throat> it I began to make marbles for them, <clears throat> cat's eye marbles and swirly marbles and things like that. But nothing really got them until I thought about this photograph that the Apollo astronauts had taken on their way back from the moon. And it was Jim Lovell who looked at the triangular window of a spacecraft. And he observed that he could cover the Earth with his thumb, which of course you can if you just get the right distance and the right perspective. And so that next day I began to make marbles that were really meant to be planets to give the kids a little bit something more to think about than just the techniques of glassmaking. And inadvertently, in doing that, I stumbled upon the most amazing thing, that little marbles, everybody in the world gets it. Marbles or planets transcend language and race and culture and gender and age and perhaps even time. I want to show you some details, some little photos of uh, planet surfaces, but in doing so, I also want to tell you another little story about this little tiny goblet, about an inch and a quarter high. Um, archaeologists throughout the Middle East found these goblets, and they could not figure out what on earth they were used for, whether they were um, for religious purposes or, I mean, they're too small to drink wine out of. Um, whether they were for medicine, whether they were, uh, had, uh, were for unguents or makeup. No one really knew until my friend, Dr. Brill, chief scientist at the Corning Museum of Glass, was in Herat, Afghanistan, and he observed a glassmaker making these little goblets, and he got all excited and asked, that's actually Mars. Um, he, uh, he asked this glassmaker what these little goblets were for, and the guy didn't even answer, he just pointed up at a bird cage. And there was one for seed and one for water. And for two centuries, the archaeologists had gotten it all wrong. And I just, I just loved that, that they could just completely blow it. And at the time, there, there, no one was collecting my work, certainly not museums, not galleries, barely any collectors. And so I thought, you know, Maybe, maybe I should just start leaving my work around the world for archaeologists to find, and then someday 
I'd have things in museums. So I began right here <clears throat> in town on my bike route and uh, put a planet in the stone wall there. And then as I traveled further from home, this is a little town in western New England. This is a bridge that I bought years ago. <laughs> and and uh, you guys didn't know I owned this, did you? And, uh, but anyway, I've hidden planets all over that thing. And uh, as I traveled further from home, I'd hide planets wherever I went. And whenever I, people would come to visit and they'd say, well, we're going up to the Arctic Circle to go bass fishing or whatever. And uh, so I'd say, please, can you take a planet along and hide it? Which is how my work managed to get to Kazakhstan and to caves and to the moats around castles where I thought there would be lots of archaeologists looking for stuff. And, and there was a project for a number of years to take them to the great wonders of the world. Um, this is a future wonder of the world, Bethlehem Steel. But, you know, I'm so, I'm so dumb sometimes. I realized along the way that if you really want archaeologists to find your work, you got to go to where archaeologists go. And so I started hiding my work in archaeological places throughout Mesoamerica <laughs> and and uh, South America, Central America. And, and, but in 2000, I made this sort of a more official thing. I began to call it the Infinity Project, the Infinity Glass Project. This was my website long ago. And people can write in on my website and propose where they'd like to send a planet. If I like their idea, I'll actually send them two, one to keep and the other to hide. And that's how planets have gotten to the base camp of Mount Everest and to Iceland, this is uh, the ambassador, U.S. ambassador to Iceland hiding a planet, the ambassador to Brunei hiding one in the South China Sea. And for a long time I had a, a thing about oceans because uh, they're a little harder to find, of course, but it's kind of cool. And uh, this is Dr. Bob Ballard, uh, undersea explorer with a remotely operated uh, undersea vehicle in the Mediterranean, putting a planet. And then, then it seemed like a logical thing to try to hide planets in the most remote locations I could. Marianas Trench, of course, uh, but the North Pole and the Trans-Antarctic Mountain Range in the South Pole, hard to get to. And then I thought about Arctic explorers like Ernest Shackleton. This is his grave on South Georgia Island and his planet. And then I've even tried things like having, you know, uh, other species help. <laughs> this is an abandoned British fort in Bundi, India, and two monkeys working on that. One of my great challenges was to try to get a planet here. And you would be surprised at how hard it is to get into the White House. But I was given an opportunity um, when uh, Laura Bush invited me to brunch. And I, I went through, it's a tough time for me because I had to sort of weigh all my moral and political and other convictions against the lure of free food. <laughs> <laughs> and as an artist, at any rate, that's the planet in the state dining room. And I was also, uh, I had the opportunity to meet the Pope. And, and so I went to Castel Gandolfo in Italy. And, you know, it's weird, but a lot of things can go through your mind when you go to meet the Pope. <laughs> and actually, a, a, a real genuine fear that I had was that if he brushed up against me or took my hand, that my hand would start to burn and shrivel, proving once and for all that everything that my mother said about me was absolutely true. <laughs> the Pope's planet is hidden behind the Swiss guard, who was easily distracted. I have to say that once I learned how to fly, it greatly enhanced my ability to hide my work around the world. I put this window into the plane, <laughs> and here I am uh, flying actually another plane up from the Tasman Sea inland on the Wanganui River in, on the North Island of New Zealand. There have been many of these. I, in this few minutes, I only have a, a I can just show you this, a little of these things, but <laughs> it finally came to me really unfortunately just a couple of years ago, that if you want to have your work in museums, you should hide your work in museums. 
This is the Corning Museum of Glass, admittedly the sort of the, the most amazing place in the world for glass. This is outside the director's office, <laughs> hiding a planet, and wouldn't you know, wouldn't you know, this planet was excavated at the museum and identified as the work of Josh Simpson. It is one of thousands of planets that Simpson has placed around the globe in his infinity project. All right, well, if you think the White House is tough to get into, you should try to convince NASA to take things to outer space. And, and I want to let you know this, too, that the Russians are equally difficult to deal with. Um, and unless you happen to know a spaceman or spacewoman, you're kind of out of luck. Um, but fortunately for me, my wife is an astronaut. And, um, and uh, so on her last third space flight, uh, she took planets with her aboard a Russian Soyuz rocket that launched from Baikonur. And here she is docking uh, with the station. And the station, and here is her planet. And you know, I don't know whether they came back or not. It might still be up there. Thank you very much.